trouble melts like lemon drops High above the chimney top, that's where you find me, oh, somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly, and the dream that you did to, oh, why, oh, why can't I?
like lemon drops High above the chimney top That's where you find me Oh, somewhere over the rainbow Bluebirds fly And the dream that you did to
musical performances before we get started with our program of about five speeches. So my aunt had a very special relationship with so many of you. So if you'd like to say a couple words, please find Anisha, who's right over here, um, and we will add you to the set. You know, we want to hear happy stories, sad stories, funny stories, uh, anything really. Um, we want to hear it all. So to kick us off today, um, you know, Bob has been playing the lovely guitar for us, and we'll kick our program off the way we kicked off. <coughs> Millen's and my uncle's memorial with Stairway to Heaven. Thank you, Bob Burnett. I'm Judy Jager. This is my partner, Bob Reed. Uh, I met Aruna when our sons entered kindergarten in 2003. Uh, Aruna and Sanjeev were among our biggest boosters and supporters when I started playing music professionally and when Bob and I started playing together. They hosted house concerts for us. Uh, they hired us to play at completely inappropriate places <laughs> where nobody was listening, but they paid a lot of money. <laughs> it was a big deal. In fact, Dan Z was at one of those, I think, one of the many people not listening that night. <laughs> but they... Uh, they loved music. I used to watch Sanjeev when we played, and he always closed his eyes. 
and Aruna would hold the dog and listen. And in the last six months, I would make the trip from Oakland across the bay to Portola Valley where I used to live. And um, the, the uh, top of my navigation for recent trips, the first thing is on Golden Hills because I went there so much. And I would always bring my guitar and my ukulele and um, we would visit and friends would come and go and then eventually she'd say, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and I would get out my guitar and I'd play one or two, maybe sometimes three songs. And, People would hold hands and uh, we all cried. I had to wait until I stopped singing to cry because you can't do both at the same time. So I'm gonna try and control myself. Uh, this first song, we're gonna play two songs for you. Uh, the first one, um, Aruna loved, Jaya loved. Um, but that's, I think that's enough. Yes. So this next song, 
The words come from A.A. A. Milne. If any of you read Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh when you were young or had it read to you, um, the words come from one of A.A. A. Milne's poems. Um, Called Spring Morning. Spring Morning, and, and then my Bob, he put it to music.
boat and his career, and the two of them were inseparable. In fact, many of you here knew Sanjeev before you knew Aruna, right? So that's, uh, that's how much uh, they were together. Uh, and by the way, today we welcome hearing stories about Sanjeev too, not just Aruna. So, you know, feel free to think about stories about Sanjeev that you want to share too. As we all know, Aruna led a highly productive and successful life. Productive in many dimensions, work, philanthropy, fighting cancer, travel, and wine connoisseur. That's probably among the top. Uh, we started a Google photo album capturing snapshots of Aruna, of Aruna's life. This album is crowdsourced, so many of you contributed and others are welcome to contribute. But the interesting thing about a crowdsourced photo album is you get to see the whole person because we all shared a slice of Aruna's life, but none of us shared her whole life except Aruna, right? So this whole mosaic comes together in many ways when you go to the album and see, oh my God, so many dimensions to her, so many friends, etc. Anyway, so today, today's speeches will also uh, give us a chance to learn about these various aspects of Aruna. Each one of you will share a different story that will kind of uh, help put that puzzle together on who was Aruna, right? And, and Sanjeev for that matter. And I look forward to you hearing your stories. I'll kick it off with my story now. Uh, my dad did a few things as we were growing up that helped uh, shape Aruna. One of the things he did was he treated Aruna, who was a girl, no different than the boys, right? There was none of this, oh, boys and girls have less education, none of that kind of stuff. From an opportunity perspective, education, and more, she was an equal, and there was no limitation because she was a girl. And the results, we all know, speak for themselves, right? I mean, she, she carved a wonderful path in life. My father said and demonstrated through the way we lived that in many ways, friends are more important than relatives, okay? And this is partly because we grew up in a town where we didn't have much relatives anyway. And so it was with Aruna. Many of you spent more time with Aruna and therefore were closer to her in many ways than me, for example, okay? So because she anchored her life around friends. And of course, her own immediate family, needless to say. And it was her friends, you guys, that brought her the greatest joy. You look at all the smiles in those photos, it's because of you guys and interaction she was having with you folks. So, you know, thank you all for making her life what it was and letting her enjoy life. And uh, as we were growing up, my dad gave her special treatment because she was the youngest and she was a girl. As a slightly older brother, that special treatment often irritated me. <laughs> when we had a fight, Aruna and I, she got the benefit of the doubt and I got the belt. <laughs> it was only after I had my own daughter that I realized how special father-daughter relationships are. And now I think I can forget that a little bit. <laughs> that special father-daughter uh, relationship was repaid in the last few weeks of my dad's life. When he was in hospice, she quit her job and moved in with my parents to take care of them. So that's how much she loved them and my dad. Growing up, I did not realize how special Arna was going to be. There was no sp specific uh, competition between us, but I assumed, because I'm the older one, I was equally smart, that I should do better financially. <laughs> Let's just say she put a decisive end to that <laughs> when she struck gold with Siebel System stock. The rest, as they say, is history. Now, having money does not automatically result in generosity. Sanjeev provi provided lessons on generosity for Aruna, right? That training was continuous because Sanjeev was in a whole new plane of generosity, right? And we hear about that uh, with some of your speeches today, too. One example of their generosity was an Alaskan cruise for the extended family to celebrate Millen's first birthday. It was an amazing experience. Uh, Aruna and Sanjeev took their nephew and nieces on lovely vacations, okay? So they just, they still, uh, have, I, I hear great things about that. 
And that generosity training from Aruna stuck, from Sanjeev to Aruna, stuck even after he passed away. One example of that was how much sea candy she bought when she was checking out of the hospital for the hospital staff at Stanford. She didn't buy one box for them to share. She bought a dozen boxes of sea candy, enough for every major caretaker throughout the whole ships, okay? So that's how gener that's an example of the generosity they had, uh, and, you know, in many ways because of Sanjeev's, uh, you know, influence. Arna was also very philanthropic. Uh, in many ways, you know, we all know about her cancer research, donations, et cetera, et cetera. Another one related to the family is she funded the education of my dad's, of the grandchildren of my dad's younger daughter. And one of them is Naresh. And you know, he did so well, he's now living in USA, right? And that's thanks to Aruna paying his education bills. I also want to touch about <coughs> Aruna's, <coughs> yeah, Aruna's very special mother-daughter relationship. Aruna called her mom multiple times a day. Sanjeev and Aruna took my mom on many vacations, which gave my mom many fond memories. <coughs> Additionally, they took her out for dinner a lot. She fondly remembers this wonderful place, dim sum place in San Francisco. She still says, hey, let's go there. It's a wonderful place. So she had such wonderful memories thanks to how well they took care of her. Their departure leaves a huge gap in, her, in my mom's heart and life. And of course, uh, many of you, most of you probably know, my mom also lost her oldest son. So she is, a, you know, a baby. So for many of you who visited my mom since our past away, thank you so much, and please do visit her whenever you get a chance. Uh, she does appreciate the visits. Now, moving on to a couple of fun tidbits about Aruna, because we all want you guys to share fun tidbits, by the way, right? My mom often hosted delicious lunches during weekdays at her home. Aruna often came home with Milan, and the first thing she did was she dashed for the food and started eating. Millen can fend for himself. <laughs> My guess is this is from the training from all the flying she did when the airline crew tells you put the oxygen mask on yourself first. <laughs> it's just a guess. <laughs> now, being a guy, I was not privy to Aruna's girl-to-girl -girl talks, right? But I did hear she called the Prime Minister of UK, Rishi Sunak, Delicious. <laughs> I, I hope some of you can share some stories related to that. Now, the most important lesson I learned from Aruna was it's okay to have dessert first. She did that often. I learned that from her. I love it. You know, it's like something I suggest, uh, you know, don't be shy to try that out. Now, Sanjeev threw a grand 50th birthday party for Aruna. That was 12 years ago. I recall thinking how happy I was for Aruna and them living such a wonderful life, everything seems perfect, seemed perfect for them. Of course, as we all know, that happy trajectory changed when Millen was diagnosed. That care that she gave, the care she gave Millen after his diagnosis was simply amazing. I mean, I cannot, words cannot express how well she took care of Millen in his last years. Uh, and we know, of course, they all, Sanjeev and Aruna left no stone, uh, no stone unturned in trying to see if they could cure him. But even Millen's diagnosis had a silver lining. That silver lining was this lovely dog called Milo, and there is Milo right there. <laughs> Milo brought us joy and comfort in so many ways, and we're so grateful for Kathy for ensuring Milo continues to be a loved and spoiled dog. <laughs> anyway, in closing, thank you all for coming and for Thank you all for enriching Aruna's life, and I look forward to hearing your stories. All right, up next is my brother and me, mostly him. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Aruna's nephew. Um, so <laughs> celebrating my aunt's life uh, fills me with a profound sense of admiration and gratitude. 
As her nephew, I've been privileged to witness her extraordinary courage and unwavering optimism, um, even in the face of life's toughest challenges. My aunt was a beacon of strength, um, fearlessly confronting adversity while holding on to a hope of a brighter future. Whether it was supporting Millen, my uncle facing her own health battles, or navigating the trials of everyday life, she met each hurdle with the spirit that inspired us all. Her resilience wasn't just a personal trait, it was a gift that she shared, rallying our family to stand strong together in the times of darkness. But what truly set my aunt apart was her refusal to let hardship dim her zest for life. Despite the pain she endured, she found joy in the simplest moments, cherishing time with loved ones and savoring <coughs> delicious meals, which I'll talk about, and embracing new adventures with a contagious enthusiasm. Um, as we gather to honor her memory today, I can almost hear her voice encouraging us to embrace life with that courage and optimism. And in this way, we can keep her and the rest of the family memory alive, a uh, testament to the enduring power of love and the profound impact one soul can have on those fortunate to have known them. I wanted to end this with um, a lighter note with uh, a story of my aunt. So, all of you know uh, she loved food. She loved food. And so um, she was about to uh, go into her stem cell therapy, which was going to be a pretty brutal time. They basically wipe away the immune system, leaving her quite defenseless. So she was just going to be locked up in a hospital for about three months. And, um, you know, it was a big deal for the rest of our family. We only one or one, only two people could see her during those three months. I was one of them. Um, and so there was a big party. She ate a lot of food um, that she couldn't have, seafood, this and that. Um, we were at our house and then it was like, okay, time to go to the hospital. So we went there. Um, and then at the check-in, uh, uh, the, the woman at the front said, oh, you've got um, actually another 90 minutes. You can just hang out. So then she looks at me and she goes, I want to go to Evia. <laughs> and so, uh, so, then, so then, get back in the car, go, and we have this Branzino over there, um, which she couldn't have for another three months. And then uh, while we're eating, quietly laughing, we look. My sister's having dinner, uh, having lunch right next door. And she's like, what are you doing here? Are you supposed to go to the hospital? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, this was her. She was always looking forward to the next good moment. She was able to balance the courage of facing the present with the optimism of the future. It's something that I believe was her strength um, and it's something that I will take away um, and hopefully you will too. from Atta over the years. She was one of the sparkliest people I knew. She was whip smart, funny, and had an incredible love for family and friends, as Bob I mentioned. Growing up, my mom I, um, uncle of Dr. Gambier, served as, as a really, really big role model. Um, for me and my sister, um, I really believe that our regular discussions with him shape the way we look at our lives and our purpose. I think, like so many of us today, we still have those thoughts like, how would Mama I be having this conversation? How would he deliver this message? How would he think about this problem? You know, if there was an ethical dilemma, how would he uh, navigate this situation? He trained us how to analyze things and, quite frankly, how to think. We really looked up to him. Atta saw that at a really early age, when we were very early, and facilitated and enabled us to be around him all the time. She gave us her tacit approval. As a result of this approval, I also got a little brother, an immeasurable gift. We probably spent... Um, one to two days a week in Portola Valley for the past 15 years. Uh, feels like more, actually. When Atta got sick, uh, Deepu moved in there. I remember one night, uh, she came home from the office late, and 
Uh, people called her as she was getting out of the car because it was... It was pitch black. And as you guys know, Uffa lives in like the forest in Portola Valley. Um, Mama's mom would always say that there was the forest and she never wanted to be alone in the, the jungle. She said the jungle was outside and she never wanted to be alone in the house. Um, but I was getting out of the car, walking from the parking lot into the house, and I needed to call Uffa, who was already sick at this point. I called her to make sure that she was on the phone so that if a bear or if anything attacked me, like, she would be able to hear and help me. <laughs> I don't know what the plan was. Um, but once I got inside safely, I said, I went to her room, I said goodnight to her, and then I went to bed. The next day, when I came home from work, as soon as I stepped out of my car, bright floodlights hit me <laughs> from three different directions. And I walked into the house, and I was greeted by Atha smiling in bed, asking me if the lights worked. <laughs> I'm supposed to be taking care of her, but instead she was taking care of me. I know she will continue to take care of me and all of us, no matter where she is. Thank you. We have Michelle James, who is uh, one of my uncle's students from Stanford um, and worked at his lab, and now she has her own lab there, and she had a couple words to say. She has a little baby with her, too, so the baby's coming up. my voice a little bit, so Israel might take over. <clears throat> Aruna, what can I say? They're really, I, I don't think I've met a more incredible person on every level. I came here to the States <clears throat> to, to be in, um, in Sam Kambia's lab, so I really came for him. And as soon as I arrived and met Aruna and the family, I just fell in love with them all. Such a, such a truly, truly special family who just really opened up their home and their hearts to everyone that came in. Like has already been mentioned, the generosity, the warmth, the kindness. It's beyond compare, just absolutely beautiful. It's no mistake that Aruna and Sam found each other. Just truly two beautiful hearts and people. I have so many stories of Aruna just being there for everyone when really throughout all of her own grief and sadness, she would be the first person to call whenever anything was happening. I, I thought of Aruna as my own mom here in California and I would go to her for advice on everything. And she would, no matter what was happening, be calling me, checking on me, helping me through all the things, going through IVF to get this little girl. She was there every step of the way, encouraging me, holding my hand, helping me to do all the things. All the while, she was going through her own unbelievable, unfathomable grief. I think something about Aruna that I was immediately drawn to is just her authenticity. She would cut through everything and just speak truth and show such genuine love and such, she had such humor and wit and charm. I just wanted to be around her. And that's also a big reason why we'd all go to her for advice. She was really, really our mom here. And when Sam had passed away, she called and said, come over that very morning, come over, just come. I don't know who else would do that, but she wanted everyone just to come and gather and be there. She wanted to hug all of us. 
although the, I used to be in Sam's lab, uh, and so did Is from here. And she opened up her home again, in her heart, and from that day forward, she started as her mission to take care of all of Sam's kids, us in the lab, and everything that Sam had envisioned and aspired to. And she didn't give up. Then she relentlessly called people to see, how are you doing? Are you okay? We'd be like, are you okay? Gosh. <laughs> but no, she, she, didn't, she didn't give up and, and didn't rest until every single person in that lab, Sam's family, his kids, she did not rest until each and every one of them had a plan, <clears throat> that they had a next step, that they were gonna be okay. And I just think that's truly remarkable. What a, what a beautiful human is for. So, Aruna, she gave us so much. And um, she had a very, very special relationship with a little baby girl here. As soon as um, she was born, she said, bring baby, bring baby. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And are you sure? Because she wasn't, well at the time, she really wasn't that well, but she said, no, no, bring it, bring baby. I said, okay. And as soon as I brought her into the house, it's just immediate, beautiful bond that was something indescribable. They both lit up. They were both calm. And the crazy thing for me was like, she was just crying for 10 hours straight and I'd bring her into Aruna's house, <clears throat> just falling asleep on her. Something very, very sweet and special. And I think we all loved seeing them together. Just that that very nice um, one that they had. And we, we got to spend a lot of time over the last few months just going there playing, being. So we're thankful for that. We're thankful for all the things Aruna did for us. And um, I think, like was said already, the one, the thing that I'll hold on to every day as I think about her is just her, her strength, her authenticity kindness, her ability to speak truth and to push forward and help people no matter what she was going through. And just her, her love for her family and her friends and that's what mattered most in life. So thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, next up we have Chitranti and a, a group of Atta's friends that will all be coming up and speaking together. We have Michaeline, <laughs> Kathy, and Chitranti. good friends, but I wouldn't say we were the closest of friends. <laughs> and fast forward 20 years, and um, all, what a small world, she ends up in Portola Valley, where I am. Met her the first day of Nolan's kindergarten at, uh, in the kindergarten playground, and our friendship took off from exactly that moment. It, um, uh, yeah. So, anyway, we became the closest of friends. We were sisters, and it was an amazing friendship. There are three things that I want to share about my memory of Aruna. One is that she was, her family and her friends were the most important things to her. When she was in LA, it was super important after Melon was born to encourage Sanji to move to the Bay Area so she could be near her mom, her nieces, her nephew, her brothers, her sister-in-laws, 
and she wanted Millen to have that very close bond with all of them. And then um, her friends, who were equally important. They were, um, she had an incredible knack of building, caring, and valuing her friendships. And she nurtured them so well that I can see the evidence of all of you being here today and how much you care for her. Second, as we can all attest, she was very funny. She had a quick wit and uh, a sense of humor that kept me in stitches, and she always delivered with a giggle and a smile. Sorry, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, she lived in the moment. And one example of that is during our shopping trips. Now, Aruna is not a shopper. She hated shopping. But she would indulge me at times because I am a shopper. And when we went shopping, if she actually found something, whether it was a shirt, a purse, a pair of pants, uh, sunglasses, she would take off the tag immediately, pay for it, and walk out wearing it or using it every single time. She lived in the moment. And the most joy was when you actually bought it. So I actually am starting to do that now. And I'm always going to, she leaves a huge hole in my life because she's the person I actually talk to every morning. And several times a day. As I was telling somebody here, if I went out to the grocery store, I'd call her and go, hey, what are you up to? I'm actually off to the grocery store. Like, That's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so those are my memories. So I'm just going to tell you a little story. Um, I was in Winter Park, Colorado, and I got a call from Aruna. I'm in Hawaii, and you need to come. <laughs> so of course, I would do anything for my Aruna. So I landed in San Francisco, maybe took a day to unpack, get rid of the snow clothes, and get a, a little bit of uh, spring stuff together, and off I went. And it was during COVID, so it really wasn't easy. <laughs> we had to go through all the screening and craziness. I landed in Hawaii. Aruna had a complete schedule of what we were going to do. We got up the next morning. There's no time for sleep. Got up the next morning. We were out on those boats at the crack of dawn for sunrise. We saw probably five breaching whales on that one trip. Amazing. And then we segued the next day over to this little pond where they had these little fish that would do pedicures, they call them natural pedicures. <laughs> and then we would go to, of course, dinner, dinner. <laughs> Merriman's, we gotta go to Merriman's. <laughs> yes, my ties, right. <laughs> and then, um, you know, it, it just was, and then the most incredible piece of it for me was we rented um, kayaks. I had a paddleboard, she was in a kayak, and we, we literally chased the, the spouts of whales. And we got out to this one spot where we saw this baby whale going by, I mean, literally right next to us. I looked down and Big Mama was way down below. So it was a magical time for me and it kind of explains Aruna. She, she's ready to do anything at any time. She's uh, really good at motivating people to come and, and just join in, and uh, she's just such a delight. And I've learned that when you want to do something, you go out and do it. <laughs> Fantastic. So it's great to see everybody here. It's so um, heartwarming to uh, be able to talk to everyone and, and see every, every bit of Aruna's life right in this room.
So thanks for coming. So <clears throat> I'm probably not going to say, I think everyone knows how incredible Aruna is and how she has the heart of a lioness. And she really had so many hard knocks that would knock most people down who couldn't get up again. And not only did she get up every time, but she got up with a smile on her face. And I just want to share a quick story. Um, when in the summer, uh, some of the doctors uh, that were working with Aruna had basically given her two weeks to live. And I was in Michigan. And so I flew back in the second week. And I think Jackie Kubica took this video. And Aruna is standing in her kitchen. And she's walking with her little walker. And she lifts her hands up and wiggles. And Jackie goes, look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> and then, then Aruna says, I think you're going to have to do a party and call it She Lied. <laughs> because she wasn't going anywhere. And that's just who she was. So um, I'm really grateful that she was in all of our lives. We've been very, very lucky. One more quick thing. Um, there's a lot of us here in Portola um, Valley. When we think about, because she was such a big part of our lives, when we come up upon something that uh, we don't know what to do or how to handle it. The words that we say are, what would Aruna do? <laughs> and somehow, the answer comes to It us. comes every time. Yeah. And so we actually so say great. that a lot when we all get together. What would Aruna do? Thank you all. Thank you. Roma Auntie and Neela Monty, longtime friends of Atha and Mamai from LA. Phoenix. Hi, everyone. So my name is Neelam Patel, and I'm here with my husband, Baran, from Arizona. In 1996, I married into a fabulous, close-knit group of friends, um, most of whom who lived in LA. You all know who you are over there. Um, and Sanjeev and Aruna, they lived in, in LA also at the time, and were part of this group that we call the LA Gang. Um, and I, I vividly remember the first time I met them, I was starstruck. I was starstruck by Aruna's beauty, um, her uncanny, crazy resemblance to Diana Ross. <laughs> the hair, the eyes, that smile, and that, you know, infectious laugh. And then, you know, with Sanjeev, with that, you know, wicked, funny sense of humor that he had and his big, generous, loving, kind heart and both of them brilliant, you know, in their own right. And just, you know, felt so um, amazed to be introduced to this very special couple. And, you know, Beren and I, we talk about this very often, how um, amazing it was to share this rich um, and fulfilling friendship with um, these two very special people over the years and to have loved Millen like our, like our own. Um, and as, as I was thinking about, you know, a fond men memory, because we shared many, many fond memories over the years, vacations we took together and celebrations and dinners and visits, um, one that came to mind was um, when Aruna shared she wanted to surprise Sanjeev for his birthday. And this was his 50th birthday. And you all know Sanjeev, he is the ultimate person in pulling off a surprise. 
I didn't know if that was the case for Aruna, but she declared that she wanted to pull off a surprise. So she rented this fabulous, beautiful home in Santa Barbara. It was overlooking the ocean. And she told him, you know, honey, you've been, you've been, I don't know if she used to say honey, but <laughs> Sanjeev, um, that's something I would have said to Brent. Sanjeev, um, you know, you've been working so hard. Let's get away. I found this great house in Santa Barbara. Um, I'll just invite a few couples and Sangeetha and Tom, and we'll relax and we'll chill out. So this is what she told him. But the surprise with it was that she had invited the entire LA gang and bring the kids and get there by sunset and we're going to have a big party. So um, Sanjeev and Aruna, Roma and Samir, um, Sangeetha and Tom, we got there early that morning in Santa Barbara and um, we knew that we had to help her pull off the surprise. He's thinking he's there to chill out. Aruna now is like, she's getting into party mode. I gotta get this together. Um, she starts delegating. Okay, Neelam, you and I, we're gonna go to hit the grocery store, everything. Roma, you got the kitchen, you get this prepped, ready to go. Um, we head out to the store, we hit the farmer's market, the grocery store, the wine. We come back with so much stuff because we know there's gonna be 30 people descending this evening. Roma's busy, Sangeetha and Tom arrive. Um, we get back from the grocery store, there's all this stuff. Sangeetha's sort of opening up the kitchen cabinets looking for trays and stuff. And, um, and I looked over and glanced at Sanjeev. And I remember this look on his face like, suspicion is just laughing on his face. Something is going on. And you know that way he used to kind of raise that one eyebrow and do this and you know this. And then he starts with the questions, you know. Hmm, so, um, Aruna, I only took two days off. Should I call my admin and clear for the week? Because there's a lot of food here. <laughs> and then she would just, you know, giggle and do her laugh and just kind of, can you go figure out how to use the TV or something? And he'd go, he'd, he'd leave, and then we're like in the midst of the kitchen trying to get all this stuff unpacked and loaded and chill, also be trying to chill and relax at the same time. And then he'd kind of waltz back and go, you know, um, I don't know, like, uh, this does not look like, is, are the neighbors coming over for dinner? Like, if you invited some more people? And again, she'd get annoyed and just shoo him off. Can you go play with the kids and do this? And it was just the sweetest thing to watch this banter between the two of them. Clearly, he'd figured out something was going on. Something was happening, and she was determined to pull off this surprise. She was not going to let in. And this, this went on all day between the two of them. And the mischief, the fun, the laughter, sort of those sideways, sideway grins that they shared with each other, I can still picture. And it was a great weekend. It was just a fabulous weekend with all of us. And it was so indicative of the value they placed on each other, on their friends and family and our kids. And I just, I'm so grateful that um, I have that very special memory um, amongst many um, with them. And, and I'm grateful to be here with my dear friend, Roma. We, we were sort of a trio. Aruna would be here or here. And I'm grateful that, you know, we had so many little fun getaways that we did over the years. And we took advantage of whatever time we could sneak away and in the fa last few years coming up here we got to meet the Portola Valley beautiful women here and I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that um, Aruna gave that gift to us. <clears throat> I want to say on that note that I think Sanjeev actually knew about that party even before he got to Santa Barbara because the, the footnote to that is, I think when they got back home, she found a note, I, I, my memory serves me correctly, she found a note or some kind of letter written to her in a very sneaky, sarcastic Sanjeev voice, you can only imagine, 
I knew there was a party or something. <laughs> How dumb do you think I am? <laughs> yes. She still has it. Yeah. I remember hearing that when she got back home, she found this note, and I guess it said like something, how dumb do you think I am? Like, you know, he was the master planner, she was not in that <laughs> but I'm Roma Mystery, and I'm here with my husband, Samir. Um, but first I want to make a correction to something Ramesh said. I was not the duo that planned this. That's Kathy Fitzgerald, Kathy in the yellow. Um, yeah, Kathy and, and there was a whole team for sure, but Kathy and Chitra really did the lion's share of putting this together. I live in LA. Sagita, of course, yes. Sagita, Kathy, and Chitra are really the, the big planners of this event. I wanted to do something, but I don't live here, so I volunteered to organize the Google Doc and put the Evite together, and that's my name on the Evite, which I didn't think it was gonna go out. But I met Aruna in um, 1991, and I actually met her at the same time I met my husband, Samir. I met Sanjeev, Aruna, and Samir all in the month of December of 1991. I was a very, um, I was just, had just started law school, I was 22, pretty naive in the way of the world, and Aruna is a few years older. She was, she was 29, she'd just gotten engaged, she'd already had two degrees, and Siebel stock, and she was well-established, world-traveled, all the things, you know, that I wasn't. And she never let me feel it, but I, um, I really looked up to her. Like, I, I met her and we were dating, uh, we, my husband and I started dating later, and so we did couples things. So our relationship started as two young couples, and, and it was really exciting for me because she was older, but she was so savvy about so many things. And I, you know, as a, starting off in like my career, and she was already well established, I really looked up to her as a professional woman, and an Indian American woman at that too, because, you know, this is the early 90s, I didn't know, I didn't have many role models like that. So even though our careers took different paths, she felt like a role model to me, and Sanjeev was absolutely a mentor already. Samir and Sanjeev were already friends, and they, they knew each other from UCLA, so he definitely served as a mentor uh, in so many ways, not just in the medical profession, but just in life, like life lessons and so forth. And so we met at um, Sanjeev's house that he shared with Ramu, who's there in the back, and they lived in this house on Greenwood in Santa Monica. And I mean, I was struck by Sanjeev and his vast music collection. He had the largest collection of CDs I had ever seen outside of a, like a record store. He loved music, every genre, he had every CD you could, it was like asking a DJ to play a song and he had the CD. And I was just like, wow. And then you meet Aruna and she was just like, she was just ball of fire. And um, so we attended their wedding the following year in 92. And two years later, well, Samir and I got married and they were at our wedding. So we, we, like, we kind of evolved with them. And you know we did all these things as young couples. And then fast forward to, um, having kids, we both, both of our boys were born within six months of each other. So we were pregnant for a time at the same time. And then we had all those first mom experiences. And again, it was great that she went first because I, you know, you feel clueless as a first time mom. And she was like, I just, I used to just observe her and see how she was and how she did things. And she, she served again as a mentor of what to do and sometimes what not to do and, you know, with your kids. And, um, and, um, and then she always had this love of food and travel. So I want to get to like my, I think my biggest connection with her over the years, over so many shared things and there's no way to encapsulate 32 years of memories because I could be here all day. And, um, but she loved to travel and she loved food so much. And I think she got the food thing from her mom because when I met her mom, and I had her cooking, then it all made sense. And, um, and she always compared, well, my mom's food is better, and you know, that, that's whatever, my mom's food is the best. And she was not wrong. And um, so I think I was inspired by her, both of us, Samir and I, were inspired for their love of travel, because they took us along on a lot of trips, and 
they, they were so gen, like, you know, you said to they're generous. They would just treat us, because we were like students, and they were already, you know, rolling in the dough. So they would like, they're like, no, no, you're not paying. We're going to treat you. And they would like pick out these like Michelin restaurants, and they're like, it's on us. And we're like, OK. So, you know, so we would go and enjoy the fruits of their labor. And, 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 but over time, um, this thing of food became, because I, my, I think I came into my own with food, and I love to share that with Aruna. So our lives were all about, what are we eating? What are we cooking? Where are we eating? What's the best restaurant when we're going, okay, we're going to this town, she would, we, the Google research would start, well, this is like the best, we gotta go here. So she, you know, and when we had babies, it's like, okay, how do we sneak in, how do we make these cookies healthy so we're not giving sugar to the babies, and like, what are, you know, what are we gonna feed the babies? And so. This thing of food just was the common thread over time. And she loved to eat at, you know, very well-known, fancy establishments and had all the, you know, bragging rights. But it wasn't beneath her to go to the hole-in-the-wall place to get, like, the best, I don't know, like, barbecue chicken or some kind of street food thing. But she had a line. And that was, even if how well researched a restaurant was, I've had an experience with her a couple of times where we thought we're going into like, you know, what was supposed to be a good restaurant, and we walk in, and there's not many people there. There is maybe, it's empty, or there's just a couple, and she would literally say, we're not eating here now. And I would be like, what do you mean? And she's like, we're not eating here, we can't eat here, there's not enough people here, that means it's probably not that good. And I'm like, but you did the research, and you said this is where we're going to eat, and we literally would leave. Because she got really like adamant that that was not going to be an option anymore. So she had those kind of funny things. Um, and then she also didn't like to waste food. So um, I remember one of the trips we took to Bermuda, and, we're, and it's Sanjeev, because Sanjeev's giving a talk, so we said, she goes, you guys want to tag along? And so we're like, yeah, we want to tag along. So we, we all pack our little babies and we go to Bermuda. Fancy, schmancy, you know, five-star resort hotel on the beach. And then we have dinner, and there's like left pasta left. And, and so we're all going to get ready to walk away. And she goes, we can't, we can't waste it. we got to take it. So I'm like, okay. So we take the pasta back to the room. And she wants to heat it up to give like the kids or something like the next day. Where are we going to heat it up? There's no microwave. So she goes, don't worry. I got it. So back in the day, when you had the hotel coffee carafes, the glass ones, not the Keurigs or the Nespresso, she turns on the coffee carafe, heat to, so that the heating plate, she dumps the pasta into the glass coffee carafe and kind of mixes it up, and she goes, that's good, that's warm, and we fed it to Millen or And yeah, so no food went to waste, and I, you know, that was, um, and she was a very adventurous eater. She, she was willing to try almost anything, and I think Millen got his love of food from his mom because he was even more adventurous. Sanjeev, not so much. Sanjeev was a big meat eater, and so all you really need to, we needed to make sure is if Sanjeev's with us, make sure there's a really good filet mignon and maybe a good uh, cranberry juice or limonada, and he was good to go. Um, so they were, they, they had that kind of contrast between the two of them, and, and, um, and that was really nice. And the last memory I have is, and it speaks to Sunil, what you said, how despite all of her things she's gone through, the, the courageousness in which she embraced life and didn't let those obstacles hinder her from doing the things that she enjoyed and loved. I have a memory, Very, I remember when she was still living in LA and her first breast cancer diagnosis, Milan had just turned one, and we had this trip planned with Tom and Sangeetha, and uh, we were going to uh, spend a week in Provence at a villa, and we were going to go to Paris. So she gets this breast cancer diagnosis, and then the chemo started, and, and you know, it sucked, and she was miserable. And I remember going to her house, she's sitting in the backyard, and she was like, F this, I'm not gonna do this chemo shit, and we're not, you know, this is it, I'm just gonna throw in the towel. I mean, if a lot of you know her, she yeah. says that initially, and then she kind of comes around and embraces life in a big way. 
And so long story short of that is she was due to have a chemo treatment the time we would be in Provence. And her brother-in-law, Tom, is an anesthesiologist. My husband is emergency medicine, kind of a MacGyver. And he, they were like, and this was the days before 9-11 where you could pack liquids and whatnot. They're like, Aruna, we got you. So they packed, I don't know, tons of, like a whole med bag of whatever she needed, her IV drip, this, that, and the other. And um, they're like, we'll do it. So I didn't put this picture in there, but if anybody wants to see it, I have a copy of this picture. We're in this villa in Provence, and it was time for her chemo. And so they rigged this, they got a wire coat hanger, hung it up to hang the bag, and had her sit down, and she was getting juice with her chemo. She has a glass of red wine <laughs> from the Chateauneuf de Pop region in her hand, and she's smiling. And the other thing was, she did not want to miss the restaurant reservation that she picked for what was then like the best restaurant in France. And I remember it was Enoteca Pinciori. She had booked this tasting menu for all of us. And um, Kala and Steve were there too, I now remember. And she got her chemo several days later. We made, that re she, we made the reservation, had the dinner at the place she wanted. And to me, that was Aruna. So, I think the last thing I just want to kind of go on and on, but speaking to everybody talking about her friends, I think that there's a there's a quote out there that somebody said, "How do you measure a person? You can measure a person by the friends and company that they keep," and I think nothing resonates more with me than that because over the years, and especially in the last couple years, meeting all of her local friends here, because you know, she, she left us in LA, and seeing how everybody came together. I have never known anybody who has such a vast network of friends that were willing to drop whatever they were doing, fly from wherever they were, come in, cook whatever she wanted to eat, bake whatever she wanted to, what she was craving, and and then the vast connection of people from all levels of industry, of you know, tech leaders and professors and academia and the moms group and you know the book club and everything. And I felt really, and I think Neelam too, we felt really enriched by those friendships. And to me, I feel like the legacy that she left with us is now we're connected to her through all of you friends that we made up here and we'll just carry that with us forever. Here, here. Well, funny story about leftovers is that I remember one time Atha went to a restaurant, we all went to a restaurant together. The next day, um, you know, Millen wanted to eat lunch. She went in to take the leftovers out of the fridge, opened it, it was clearly someone else's leftovers. <laughs> And she still made Millie eat it. <laughs> okay, next up we have Anisha, my sister in law. Hi everyone, my name is Anisha. The first time Sunil wanted me to meet his family, he told us we were having lunch at Grandma's house and then his parents. So I dressed in Indian clothes trying to impress my in laws. And instead, we took a little detour and pulls up on University Avenue and tells us we're gonna meet Atha. So here I am, walking down University Avenue in Indian clothes and broad daylight, and go to meet her uh, eating Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> From our very first meeting, Atha's kindness and care blew me away. She called me every day, even before I moved to the Bay, to check how I was doing. Between her own hospital visits, she was excited and took charge of the little details of wedding planning for Sunil and I. Atta lived life with grace, love, and an unwavering spirit of resilience, and I hope we all carry forth her legacy in our hearts. We spent several nights talking, laughing, and even crying. I asked her to share a lot of parenting wisdom to pass on to Bibu, Patrick, and Sunil and I, my kids. She told me to tell them that their Atta loves them dearly, even though she won't meet them and to focus on what truly matters, our relationships with family and friends, 
to work extremely hard and to give back. Thank you, Atta, for being our guiding star and our century of love. You are, are, and always will be our beloved Atta, a remarkable woman whose spirit will forever dance in the corners of our hearts, bringing light, love, and joy in abundance. I promise to embody the virtues she held dear, to be tales of love and joy that echo with the sweetness of her laughter, the warmth of her embrace, and the wisdom of her words. One day when I took her to the ER and we were alone at night, she told me she wasn't ready to go. But dear Atta, as you embark on this journey to reunite with Nila and Mamai, know that you are not alone, for you carry with you a part of our souls, a fragment of our hearts that beats in harmony with yours, resonating with love that transcends time and space. Hi everyone. I've only known Aruna and Sam for four years and for seven years, um, respectively. And I got to know them because Sam likes to read cold emails. Uh, because I sent him one. Do you remember the article, And Yet You Try? Does anybody who read that article? Yeah, that article changed my life and hopefully many other people's lives. I read this article because I'm an entrepreneur and Angel, my wife, who's over there, brought it to me because we were in somebody else's house in Potula Valley because our own house was being remodeled. So we got somebody else's magazines. <laughs> so I read that article. It was on Thanksgiving Day 2016. And I read this article. She gave it to me because she knew I was looking for my next thing to do. And I, I, I felt this gripping sense of grief. I didn't even know Milan or them. But I was also very inspired by the work that he was doing in early cancer detection. And so I decided to send him an email and I said, it's not a coincidence I'm sending you this email on Thanksgiving Day. I can only imagine how hard this day is for you. But I read your article. I felt a gripping sense of grief but I'm also very inspired by what you do. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm looking for my next thing. I'd like to meet you. Two months later, we met on a Saturday morning at Portola Kitchen. And I lived in Portola Valley. I had no idea he also lived here. And so we met for three hours. And I had a long conversation with him and you know about what I was going to do next and I asked him whether somebody with my background, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a scientist, should even bother the world of biology with my presence and, he, and his, his response was, well, we need more people that are generalists and the second thing I'm going to tell you is the world of biology will always find a way to screw you over. <laughs> it will take longer than you want. It will be harder than you want. Well, that's the beginning of the story. And in the end, there was a whole company that came out of it, and it was built around Sam's idea. So it's an early cancer detection and treatment company, and I'll spare you all the details of it. But our main meeting room is called Sam's Room. And Sam is on the wall. And so because of Sam, who deeply touched me, I got to meet our room. And then I understood, because they are really each other's anchor. One example was when <laughs> they came over for dinner, and we had prepared things, you know, to the best of our abilities. And then Aruna walks in with this massive amount of food. <laughs> so we didn't actually have to make any dinner. <laughs> and they sit down and then we go get into stories and one of the one of the things they were talking about is like um, how um, Aruna is 
you know, not letting anything go to waste. I think we've heard that multiple times now. But it also has to be a good deal. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not going to happen. When the restaurant is empty, she leaves. We get that. And when there's food left over, it's going to be eaten. We get that too. But if the price is not right, it's not happening. <laughs> so they went to a concert. Sam was, Sanjeev was a super excited about it. Full on heavy metal concert, one of his things. They get there, he is ready to go. And Aruna goes on her app and is trying to get the tickets. The scalpers would not let the price go down far enough. <laughs> They went home. <laughs> and Sam was deeply pissed. <laughs> but he understood. Because that's the way it was. So if there's one word for Aruna, it's fierce. In 20... 21, I believe it was, she drummed up support for everybody to join a call with the town of Potola Valley. Who was on that call? Mm -hmm. You know what that was about? Their house was being built. The plans that Dan Spiegel, who's here, the architect, made for them. And the neighbor didn't like the house. So they filed massive complaints and they went through all these levels of complaints. Like the first time in 20 years that somebody went through three or four levels of complaints in order to stop them from building simply because they didn't want a house, house in front of them that had a roof higher than they had before. <laughs> completely, it, it was completely within the boundaries of the regulations. There was no real reason. They just wanted to be different. But they didn't know who, who they were dealing with. <laughs> so Aruna shows up. She makes her speech. She says why this has to happen and that this was already planned by Sam. And that this was the dream of dream house they were going to build. And then she let everybody else, she had already rallied the troops, line up and make statements in support of that. <laughs> Guess what? The house will be finished in three weeks. <laughs> And then there was the Stanford thing. You know, Sam had obviously led with Michael. Uh, the world's molecular imaging technology doesn't come without, you know, real drivers, and that was him. And he had made sure that Stanford had the world's best equipment for imaging. Except one machine was missing. $20 million. Not a small machine. And Sam had passed, and Stanford was about to reassign the dollars. Enter Aruna. That machine is now installed at Stanford. Here. And of course, there was not the article only, and yet you try. There was also another article that came after Sam passed, and it was called and yet there's hope. And Aruna went back to the same magazine from Stanford, and there was a follow-up article, which I'll all encourage you to read, if you haven't yet. And I would argue, in this room alone, I know of four startups that came out of this world of Aruna and, and Sam. One from you, the Pika, one from Sunil, one from Adam, and one from me. So I would argue there will be another article from those two, and it will be called, And Yet There's the Future. Thank you. Next we have Rajesh and Daksha. Okay. 
we'll come back to them later. So we'll move on to Shazia, Jen. Okay, Muna. Got it. Oh, the sign up sheet was if you wanted to say a couple words. Here. All right, so we'll go with Ramu next. <laughs> So how do you encapsulate a life, a history? Sanjeev and I were, we met as first year medical students at UCLA. Uh, I thought I was young, I was 21, and here comes Sanjeev at 19. I'm like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> and uh, we were roommates in medical school. We were roommates after medical school. We had that beautiful house in Greenwood. and. Uh, I remember thinking, oh my God, my poor patients. They have no hope. They have me as a doctor instead of Fengi. <laughs> this is amazing. This is So you realize that the shocking, the great strength. And I was there the moment Sanjeev and Erna met. Uh, the history we've shared are amazing. The last time I spoke with uh, Erna, uh, a few months ago, and, and she says to me, she says, Ramu, this is your first wife from a long time ago. I'm actually here with my second wife, Angela. Uh, Erna, when Sanjeev and Erna got married, and I said, we were still living in the house, so now we were happy three in a house. So anyways, I guess nowadays it's not unusual, but back in the day, it was uncommon. <laughs> so I guess uh, the world has changed. But anyway, in those days, we were like happy three. And I told her, I said, you married both of us? She goes, oh yeah, for sure. I knew that was happening. So I wrote something, forgive me if it doesn't 100% flow, and uh, describe kind of our history. Sanjeev drove into UCLA with a Honda Prelude. His sister probably knows that well. So uh, this is what I wrote. I, I used to call him the kid from Arizona. 19 and brilliant. MD, not enough, must have MD, PhD. Prelude, or should I say Quaalude? <laughs> Sun-torn shaded windows, of course, the shag carpet to protect the dashboard. <laughs> Let's take Lincoln, cut across Sunset, sneak into LAX, skip the traffic, back in the high life on the CD player. How many times did we make it just before the plane door closed? Long before checkpoints and TSA. One day Sanjeev missed class. What happened? got arrested for buying a donut. Turns out, Sanjeev was the only one not buying crack from the donut shop. <laughs> so, it was, uh, he would say to me, yeah, this is bizarre, this donut shop had no customers. I was the daily customer, they always looked at him, strangely. And uh, that day, the SWAT came down and uh, arrested the one man who actually bought donuts. medical school and PhD come easy. Someone decades ahead of his time. These are the things he said to me in the 19, early 80s. What if your toilet can monitor your health? What if your mirror can track all the moles on your skin? I couldn't grasp beyond my TI calculator and pocket protector. <laughs> he could imagine a future and challenge you to be better. The friends, deep talks about girls and philosophy, mostly about girls. <laughs> there was a famous India trip. Some of the people who went on the India trip were here. Fantastic, fantastic food. Uh, the Balaji temple where some people bought beef to the temple, Hindu temple, bad. <laughs> so they bought their, <laughs> so they got in trouble. <laughs> Taj Hotel, five star hotels. What could go wrong? Sanjeev was the only reason the rest of us didn't kill each other. <laughs> Always the peacemaker. Relationships, heartbreaks, 
India Abroad advertisements. Some of the men in this room advertised in a magazine called India Abroad. I will not name the names. <laughs> along with Sinji, that was before we met Aruna. It was a long before, long before what they call Tinder now, what they call Tinder. Oh. It was a newspaper ad. You describe yourself. That was kind of very interesting. Anyways, <laughs> who could forget the pictures? My wife still remembers those pictures. Anyways, not these guys. <laughs> Uh, so I will not mention the names. I need to protect the guilty. <laughs> you might be able to find these guys' ads in old India abroad newspapers. <laughs> the magic moment. This was one of our friends who introduced Sanjeevan Arna. Smart, successful, and Diana Ross good looks. <laughs> and Sanjeev said, did you say Diana Ross? Of course, that's the first thing that sticks. <laughs> she was absolutely strong, resilient, and a perfect match. She could challenge him better than anyone else. I mean, Sanjeev, uh, my wife would say to me, I met a lot of smart people, but he's in a whole different league. And Erna was the only one who was in that league. Uh, she could make him laugh, and the only person smart enough to challenge him. Love, 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 wedding planning. First, we had a bachelor party in the house. Bowls left around the house to catch the explosive return of junk food, alcohol, and stomach acid. Again, I will not mention the names. Some of these people are seated next to you. <laughs> the wonderful wedding. And as I told her, Irina, you married both of us. Happy little house. Friends find love. Millen arrives. How could he be anything but brilliant? I remember the first time meeting Millen. And Sanjeev would stand next to me. He goes, Milan, what, kind of, what comes out of a light socket? Electrons. <laughs> <laughs> what child says that? <laughs> a genius in his own right. Friends spread across space, memories of brief get togethers, career rockets to the status quo and beyond for Sanjeev and Arna. He launched so many careers, so many people. In his impact and Erda's impact will be long before all our lifetimes, long past us. And Arna was always in the moment, handled every obstacle with grace. She no, never focused on her pain. Every time I talked to her, it was more about, how are you, how are the kids? It's amazing, never focused on that. In her presence, you always felt the care. In the midst of struggle, she never lost her sense of humor. The injustice of existence, too much tragedy for us to understand. Memories will come. We will take Lincoln, cut across Sunset, drop into LAX, catch the flight as they close the door again, until we're back together again in the highlight. I'll miss you all. years ago. Um, I knew of the Gambier family because you know, we're, both, we're both in Portola Valley and through the school community. My kids are a little younger than Milan was and my son was full admiration of Milan because he was such a cool rocker and so he would go to these school concert and he just aspired to be like Milan. The music career never went anywhere, but the inspiration stayed. Um, got to know um, Aruna a little better through a yoga class we took every morning at someone's barn here in Portola Valley. That person who is here who was so generous to open up her barn and we would gather every morning in yoga class. Aruna and I would stay in the back and all these yoginis would do their thing and I was like, you know, these Cirque du Soleil moves and, <laughs> and Aruna and I would be in the back and I would, we would look at each other and be like, oh, my God, my God. And we would say, stay low, stay low. <laughs> Anyways, the, the bonds started getting uh, stronger and we would hike. 
Um, moving on, years later, um, through we connected more through uh, Bellarmine, where Milan was in school. I had a good friend uh, who was a parent there too. She also lost her son through a brain tumor. Her son was also a student at Bellarmine. She uh, is going through a lot of other grief with the daughter. And she said, she contacted me one evening. She says, I really would like to, to be in touch with a, um, a doctor at Stanford. You know, this doctor seems to be in the same specialty that my daughter, uh, could help my daughter. And she says, I would like, you know, can you help me? I said, I, I don't know, but you know, Aruna is very connected. I did not know Sanji. And Aruna is very connected, of course. And, and so one night, I, uh, one evening, I sent an email. It was past midnight. And I, I say, you know, remember Anne Marie, you know, Milan, JW. And I uh, said, could you help make that happen? And within half an hour, it was, like I said, past midnight. I uh, got an email back from Sanji uh, with that doctor copied on there. And um, yeah, he gave instructions to that doctor, please, can you see, uh, can you connect? I write back to uh, Aruna, I said, oh, you must be traveling in a, in a different time zone. Um, yeah, stay there until so the next day. I, 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 I tell a friend, she says, um, Sanji is very ill. I, I did not know how ill he was. And sure enough, 10 days later, he passed. So, I mean, and they were not traveling. He was actually on his laptop in the middle of the night trying to help people. And my friend said, yeah, that's who Sanjeev was. I wish I had known Sanjeev better, but um, <coughs> clearly the family, yeah, I would be good. Uh, it just shows what type of, of, of you know, what kind of people they are. Anyway, so the, um, years later, I'm telling you my last story. So one morning, um, we're at a, um, I'm at Arunas with a couple of friends, and Aruna says, um, you know, I want to go to Shepanis. And I got like, okay. Um, that was like late. That was in, uh, yeah, 10 days before she passed. And uh, she said, okay. Uh, she said, you could go now. And we look at the friends in the room and we're like, wow, you know what this is like a long waiting list, you just don't get in there. And uh, she says, yeah, I really would like to go. So we go like, okay, we'll try. So somehow we got in two days later. So we went there for lunch, and um, four of us, and um, she orders pretty much everything on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> It was an afternoon not to be forgotten. Um, we stayed until they asked us to leave because I had to set up for the evening for the dinners. Um, I just want to say how grateful I am that I got to know Aruna, that I can call her a friend, that she taught me to like seize a moment, seize a day, carpe diem and in this um, surreal tragedy, I would say, I mean, the people have, have met the um, Gambier family, Aruna's family, her friends from LA, and all the local friends here. Uh, I am super grateful for that, and that's, that's Aruna who made that happen. Thank you. calling a few more people, but please feel free to go out and grab some food or uh, coffee as well. That's Lots of desserts. Lots of desserts as well. And, and Sophie too. Um, next we have Wen. Anyway, um, 
Okay, come on up. Don't go this way. Don't don't go that way. Go this way. So so to keep this to keep the show rolling, um, this is that's okay. She, she needs to practice. Okay. So this is my spouse who has. Hello, okay. you come up here, please. Burn it. Come on. Burn up, please. So so. They were like this small clique of um, young co-eds at Cal that met their first week at the all-girls dorm. Um, and it was, and these were part of so anyway, I know there's a Berna, there's a Myrna, and there's a Runa. So, so I know that there's all these little things, like little clicks that I hear, but I, as a spouse, I can say, Okay, 1983, I was the one that said she looked like Diana Ross first. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, yes, it's a very interesting bottle I'm looking at. It has my notes on it. So, <laughs> um, I, I know that uh, Ronlin and Rena have been best friends forever, like 45 years. And what I do really know and really, really, really respect about the two of them is that they hold their confidences with one another. Because I would know while I was dating her, I'd call a Runa up and say, hey Runa, what, what did she say? Well, I'd ask her. So, I did. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. And so I remember first, like I said, first meeting her in, at, at Mrs. Botify's house. And, and this is going to kind of ramble a little bit, um, but uh, I remember going over there and having something, actually the best Indian food ever. So I've always been asking, come on, come on, teach me, teach me, please teach me. I'll give it to go to India Cash and Carry and get all the ingredients. And then you finally shut me up that last time where you opened up your refrigerator and there are all these little stainless steel <laughs> containers, like 40 of them. And she goes, I don't, she goes, I don't even know what's in this one. I said, oh my God. She goes, I just brought it back from India. I said, okay, never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess I'll have to just keep going to Orem instead. <laughs> so, um, so Raman, uh, okay. you guys, you want to say a little bit? Okay. While I read my... God. Okay. I am aphasia, okay? <laughs> and I, I feel like, I, I look back and I think, first of all, I, and I wish you, uh, gosh, Runa, um, Runa, okay, yeah. Um, anyway, I had, we, we, um, we want to have the, um, oh God, <laughs> I know what I saw, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley, every time, and I thought that she had this big, big hair. I said, what the hell is going on? I gotta meet this person. And then it was. She's huge, huge figure up, up and down. Well, anyway, I thought she's like a big, beautiful. And all the way, like, we have so many, she's given so many, you can give me. And Runa could tell me anything. Um, I loved her. Please, I loved her before anything. So if anything else, I, um, I love her. So go your turn. <laughs> Here yeah, I know. Here, so. That's okay. That's how we do too. But um, I met Aruna my freshman year at Cal. Yeah. We were in a forced triple. It was, I mean, it was, it was a room made for two people, and there were three of us in there. It was a corner. It was a corner. I don't think it was a corner. I don't remember it being a corner. <laughs> so um, it was Aruna. Berna and Myrna, and we thought for sure the RAs must be playing some kind of joke. Because these were before the days when you got to like figure out who you wanted to be, I mean, who you wanted to uh, room with. You didn't get to meet your roommate beforehand. But then we met this yeah. girl with the big hair and just bouncy, bouncy personality, yeah. and she would uh, be ready for anything. And that's what I appreciate most about Aruna. She was always interested in your life, and um, actually, I just became a grandma, um, December 25th, and the first person I wanted to tell was Aruna. 
And I actually texted her and I told my husband, like, two weeks later, I said, you're going to think I'm Looney Tunes, but I had to tell her. And I texted her. So I know she knows, and I know she's happy for me. And that's exactly what I said in my text. And so I love you, Aruna, and I miss you. All of you, please. Yeah. Thank you. years on, on your name tag. She has 43, so it must be 43. Okay, sorry. So I'm just going to say a few other things because longitudinally we, 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 our lives have come in and out of focus a lot. I remember, uh, I remember when you guys went to Club Europa on some, some cruise, and it was like they had all these pictures with all these people, guys, um, and I asked, what's going on? So I, I so Brown was like, you can't, you know, what's the old, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's like they, that came up again and again and again throughout their life. They would go to other things, other tours, and I was like, well, yeah, we, we're, we're sworn to secrecy, we can't say anything about that. So of course that, that just made me crazy. It's not crazy enough. But I remember another crazy time when, how many people remember when Aruna drove on Alfa Romeo? Romeo? <laughs> I was there when she went from, on the first test drive. And it was like, I thought that, I thought she was gonna have a problem. But as it turns out, the guy that was the dealer come, came back totally white knuckled. <laughs> and she goes, I love it. And she's looking like, oh my God. <laughs> so, so, so that was another one of those circumstances where Aruna, you know, she, she thought very logically, but she also wanted to, she, she had that, that joy of life, right, that you want to be. So, um, and then I remember she and I and Rita <laughs> were at uh, doing our masters together. And Rita was always in the front row, being very studious. And Aruna and I would go in late, sit way in the back and go, is it over yet? <laughs> is it over? Get a good work. <laughs> so again, another one of those situations where, you know, she, she kept life and the perspective on life. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you were there. Were you there? You were never there with us. Okay, it was, it was her. I, I get you two mixed up. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, let's see. You know, I should have written in bigger font. So, um, I wanted to say a couple things about Sanjeev. But I remember, so, our, my extended family life and Sanjeev's crossed over at UCLA because a lot of my uh, siblings and in-laws went to UCLA Med. And I remember my brother-in-law coming back one day and saying, um, oh yeah, there's this new wonder kid. And the dean of medicine came and talked to the house staff and said, this kid is untouchable. You cannot just beat him up over, you know, like, uh, how many doctors are in here besides remove? You know, it's like, you know, you know how it was. You know, the, the, they took advantage of, of the little indentured servants. So they said, he is untouchable. You cannot do that to him. But of course, when you tell these physicians, freshly minted, what do they do? When you tell them not to do something, they do it. So they went after Sanji for the first couple weeks, and they said, Oh my God, he is the smartest guy we've ever met. So they, after that, they kind of left him alone. But again, my again, my son used to ask, "Oh, who's the smartest guy that you know?" I said, "Oh, Uncle Sanjeev is." So then, you know, life has a strange way of coming back on itself. So for his uh, Santa Clara uh, Santa Clara math, not Santa Clara science fair. We went over to, with his poster board, over to Aruna and, and Sanjeev's house. And he presented, and I think it was, did you, were you in 2011? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because my son ended up being grand prize alternate to some woman at press. So, so that was you. Uh, but, 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 but Sanjeev is so thoughtful with the way he asked his questions. It wasn't like overbearing or, or pedantic. And my son goes, someday I'm going to grow up to be like him. I said, fat chance of that. <laughs> <laughs> roll, roll the, the tape forward. Let's see how many years. I forget how many years. But uh, at some point, my son was in uh, Sanjeev's lab at Stanford. And they had a, a 
I told my son, you know, you, you maybe book smart, but that's about it. So they had a meeting, and they were introducing all the, whatever the little plebes are called. And my son, my son said, oh, hi, Uncle Sanjeev. And the whole room went, like, he goes, he goes, what did I say? I said, what do you think? Everyone else calls him Sam, or, or Professor Gambier, or Dr. Gambier. He goes, oh, okay, got it. Um, but much like, uh, okay, where is Neil? <laughs> he's, he's, he's outside. He's outside, okay, he's outside. I can say whatever I want then. Um, <laughs> but much like Neil, while my son was in grad school, he also said, okay, it's time to bail out. I got the cred now. I can bail out. And I talked to him. Sunil, he pretty much did the same thing. It was he, he, he was at Stanford at, in grad school and he bailed out. So it's like, you know, ultimately, um, my vision is going badly. So, um, but I, I, I don't know that uh, Sanjeev would have been happy with like my son. My son was doing something that was very image related, um, image processing. But now, like everyone else, my son's company is generative AI. It's like okay, great. So. We'll, we'll see how that looks out. So ultimately, I mean, with Aruna, she had lots and lots of friends, but always maintained confidences. That's, what, that, that's my takeaway from her. It's, it's, I, I don't know if other people know this, but she's very compartmentalized with respect to all these things. And I really appreciated that. I mean, it's, it's and my wife is saying, OK, it's time. Yeah, she pointed your watch. Yeah, got you. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. and. Uh, and Roma, I, I appreciate you setting up all, all the stuff and, and everyone else. And it was nice to see you move. It's nice to see all the people that I haven't seen for a long time. So, and everybody, way to go! Next we have Joe. So um, I've known Sam, I got to know Sam as he entered graduate school. So I start pre-remo. Uh, <laughs> so Sam needed to buy a house. So he first bought a house with me and um, uh, my ex-wife because at the time scholarships were taxable. And that gives you an idea of how much money Sam got in scholarships. <laughs> So we were in biomath, and um, uh, we were in classes together, including I think Dr. Phelps's class. Who he was, Dr. Phelps, just an amazing lecturer and an inspiration. Um, and but what I also noticed is Sam wasn't just the academic. He wasn't just the play Jimi Hendrix at a very high volume. <laughs> he was sort of like the Godfather for other male Indian students. And our house turned into the Inn of India. <laughs> because it turns out all males have trouble with their fathers, and that is not, the Indian community is not exempt from that. So Sam would say, and some of these people are here, so I'm not going to mention names. But they say, someone's going to be here for a couple days, someone will be here for a week, someone will be here for two weeks, someone will. But nicely, they were rotating in. <laughs> and then we became like a production factory for helping people apply to medical school. What was remarkable is Sam did that without it impacting his studies. I mean, he went way beyond. And he was very smart, and there was another exceptionally smart, you know, in medical school at 18 in two PhD programs, too sharp. And so there was a little bit of competition. And it was a fabulous competition. You know, they were both the two smartest people I met. But what Sam did was he was incredibly social political, and I think he had inspiration in this room. Uh, and um, he was incredibly generous, and he had a great spirit about him. And he had this childlike curiosity. Uh, so he ended up getting kicked out of the house when my son was born in December, uh, January of, of uh, 91. So he moved in, he bought a, he then cashed out and moved in with Ramu. Uh, but he would always come back and he was practicing on my son probably for when he had a son. <laughs> <laughs> you know. 
I said I had to answer a bunch of questions. Of questions. So you go, those aren't the questions we usually ask. So, uh, um, and, and he tells a story about the first time he, he had a patient. And I think the patient said, okay, Sonny, when is the real doctor showing up? <laughs> he goes, he looked young. And, and the final time about, I know that Sam did a lot of work on the phone. And then you realize he has a voice. If you hear his voice on the phone, you think he's six foot two, two ten, and in perfect shape. <laughs> you meet him in person, and you're probably, so he used his voice, and he knew his voice was good. And that's self-realization at a young age. Yeah. Uh, and Rumo, I loved your comment about the carpet on his dashboard on the brain. <laughs> um, and I also knew a little bit about Sam's dating life, which I won't get into. <laughs> but I did notice he dated attractive women, he dated brilliant women, he dated nice women, but they all fell under his shadow. Because you need a certain energy, and they just all wilted under him. Under that brilliance. And Aruna, when he finally said, I think I found the one, I go, I was thinking, how could there be one? <laughs> and then I met Aruna and I realized, oh, brilliant, beautiful, humorous, immediate um, likability, you know, all those things, and yet she had a presence that did not wilt. And that was damn impressive after what I'd seen. So, um, so I was immediately impressed with this one. And then, um, you know, I don't know when Sam got the patent on the toilet that Ramu was talking about, but he got the patent on the toilet. And he was so impressed about certain anatomical features that are unique to individuals. And, and, he, was, and he would love talking about it. Like, who talks about unique things other than your fingerprints? But Sam had to go there, and it's related to toilets. And that's all I got to say. It's also lovely to see Milo. I would come up and visit uh, Sam in a room, and, and um, then after Sam passed, I would send gifts to Milo. And uh, so, Milo, I hope you appreciated those those uh, those things that you probably chewed up by now. You know, and then even through Aruna's illness, she was always asking about my kids. In fact, she would meet up with my son and my son's son, who probably was one at the time. He's now two. Uh, and she would always ask, and I thought that was really incredibly thoughtful. During COVID, she would meet, uh, and, um, and I thought it was also interesting because it's, she met with the, the person who kicked her husband out of the house, so, uh, and, and his grandchildren. Um, and then the final sort of profound thing that Aruna gave me is I asked her after Sam's passing, uh, because I knew her more as through Sam, right? They were a team, and now she was individual. And I, I had more time to chat with her. Uh, I asked her how she was feeling. And she said, like, the most profound thing I've ever heard, because my older sister drowned when she was 19. So I know what death does in a family to when a child dies. I saw it with my parents. I asked her how she was doing. She said, she's doing really well. And this was shocking to me. And I said, explain. How did you overcome the death of your child, who I was with, and I saw how much it hurt her and Sam? And you now your husband died, and that's me. And she said, I wasted the last three and a half years of Sam's life grieving for my son. And I'm not going to do that anymore. I thought that was damn amazing. And I said, wow, you know, even I can learn things along the way. And so I'm incredibly grateful for them, but I know how much you influence them. So I look around the room, uh, and I'm incredibly grateful that you guys influence them so they can influence us in return. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, thank you all for being here, and it's great to be here. Next, we have Dan. So 
So, hi, my name is Dan, and I've had the pleasure and privilege of knowing and working with Aruna and Sanjeev since 2011, uh, when they hired me to design their deck. I'm an architect, and I've long felt that architecture is a fundamental act of optimism. All of this effort, expense, disruption, vulnerability, precedes benefit, all in the hope of making a better environment and a better existence. I was introduced to Sam and Aruna through my parents, Helen and David, who are here, and uh, who were colleagues of his at Stanford. And with this endorsement and a graduate degree at Harvard, uh, they decided I'd be up to the task of designing their deck. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they knew this was my first real commission, and I was fresh out of graduate school. I was full of not just ideas, but concepts. Uh, now I realize that the standard practice probably would have been to draw a deck on a piece of paper, show how big it is, maybe what materials it's made out of, something like this. Um, so I think back at this with a little bit of embarrassment on the day when I showed up for our first design meeting at their house, uh, pulled out of my trunk a two foot by two foot by four foot topographical model of their hillside with a cantilever deck and things that we were calling crow's nests and catwalks. It was honestly kind of absurd, um, but Sam and Aruna didn't seem confused at all. They pushed me to go even further, and of course, for even less money. <laughs> they were the rare people who saw opportunity uh, even in the smallest endeavors, who thought that anything worth doing was worth putting the entirety of your effort and ability into. And from that, you can find value, find enjoyment, find comfort. We were working on our next project together when Millen became sick. Years later, we searched for a new property together to build a home that, that might honor him. They found a magical perch not far from here, and the two of them pushed us and pushed us to produce something truly adventurous. We must have made 50 process models. And at this point, I was really starting to regret setting the expectation of these models. <laughs> Even as Sam was undergoing treatment and they were immersed in their work, they isolated focused time for rigorous design discussions. Working with Sam and Aruna pushed us to be better. There were so many times when Aruna might have given up. The project was Sam's idea after all, and he was no longer there to see it through. There was relentless opposition from a neighbor, as Syria mentioned earlier. And then the onset of the pandemic, and cruelly, her own illness. With surprisingly colorful language and sharp humor, she never wavered, or at least not that I could see, and never stopped believing that a good outcome was possible, even probable. Even as it became clear to her and eventually to the rest of us that she wouldn't be here to experience it, I must have known when Millen's statue was removed from the plans for the entry courtyard, but still couldn't accept it. And honestly, she is right, I hope she is right, that she has made something strong and beautiful that will continue to do good, that will bring another family joy, and that will uh, add to her legacy by funding cancer research in Millen's name. The last time I saw Aruna, she asked what I thought the house should be called. And I love naming things, as you can see, but I've been really struggling with this one. I asked what Sam would have called it, and she said she'd think about it and get back to me. A few days later, she called and said that towards the end of his life, Sam had started watching Buddhism movies and would have liked the term moksha, which I realize is a cross between religions here. A concept similar to nirvana, meaning relief from the unbound cycle of life and death. This was the last time we spoke. I hope she has found this relief too, as certainly the impact she has made on my life and all of our lives continues unbounded. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rohit. Um, I'm Aruna Auntie's uh, nephew. Um, Syriac, you mentioned her ferocity in your speech. Um, I have a couple of anecdotes to that effect that I'd like to share. So, 12 years ago, um, 
The San Francisco 49ers were playing the Atlanta Falcons in the NFC Championship game. And we were watching the game at um, the Bodhi Party House in Saratoga. Um, I, I didn't take Arunanti to be a big football fan, but something just changed that day. Um, <laughs> you know, and the game did not start off pretty. And uh, with every Falcon score, mood was getting kind of darker in the room. And I was uh, learning some really colorful vocabulary from Arunanti. <laughs> Nice, right? So I try to lighten the mood. I say, Ar Arnaud, Tony Gonzalez, he just made that 20 yard catch. He's a Cal alum. Oh, screw him. He's on the other team. <laughs> um, but, you know, something wonderful started happening, and the Niners pulled it back with each score, and then um, they're in the lead. So, you get to the final play of the game. Uh, the Niners are ahead um, by a score, uh, but the Falcons have a ball, and they have time for just one last play. Um, Sanji Bunkel and Arunanti are sitting together on the couch. And Sanji Bunkel, very smart, incredibly erudite. I think that's an understatement, by the way. That's like calling Jordan a good basketball player. <laughs> um, but he was about to do something really dumb. So he instinctively grabs a remote and just presses the channel up button. Arunanti looks at him like, Why didn't you do that, Sanji? I thought the game was over. No! <laughs> So we wrest control of the remote from uh, Mamai, but alas, it's too late. Uh, we flip back the channel, we see the final score on the screen. Um, and even though all's well that ends well, I don't think Ernan can let that go for quite a bit. <laughs> um, a few years later, uh, so for those of you that remember Ernan's older brother, um, Chandra, uncle, who's unfortunately also no longer with us, he also really loved food, and he loved having people over to try his food, and one of his staples was uh, barbecues, right? So um, he had this really big thunder that um, Mama had actually bought him, and uh, so we, we all really enjoyed his delicious thundery chicken, but that meant, you know, a lot of leftover bones lying around, right? So um, Aruna and I, we know that Aruna and he really loved Milo. Um, and so Ramesh uncle was about to do something really boneheaded, uh, pun unintended. So I was like, oh, what if I take this leftover bone and, you know, Milo is a uh, thundery chicken all around. It's, it's, like a, it's like a shooting gallery for Milo. He's just there, uh, meerkat, hoping, hoping that someone will cave in and just feed him something. So Babai gives him the chicken bone and just starts engaging in this tug of war that just cuts through the congenial discussions happening around. And then suddenly Arnaunty just materializes right next to Ramesh. He's like, Ramesh, we never do that. We never feed chickens in the dark. Never. You hear that? Never. <laughs> Needless to say, uh, I don't think she ever trusted Ramesh's uncle uh, next to Milo and food ever again. No. <laughs> um, when I think of Thanksgiving, I immediately think of Arunanti and Sanjeev uncle. I, I think I'm not just speaking for myself, but I'm also speaking for my cousin. Some of my fondest memories uh, growing up or spending, or just spending time at their place, 390 395 Golden Hills Drive, um, in the warmth of their house, eating turkey, cranberry sauce, and falling asleep during a movie in the media room, <laughs> just digesting all of that. Um, yeah, in, in recent years, I think it's a rite of passage. You know, my brother and I, we've grown up. Um, we got dropped into this, um, got dropped into this group chat logistics for planning this year's Thanksgiving. Um, everybody's starting to claim uh, dishes that they want to make. So, uh, cranberry sauce. Um, my brother says cranberry sauce. I'll do uh, mac and cheese, pecan pie, so on and so forth. Uh, the day of. Thanksgiving, um, we get this innocuous text in the group chat from uh, Ramesh uncle. Aruna's request, please save mashed potatoes and mac and cheese. Didn't think anything of it, so granted. Um, sadly, um, a week later, she left us and I dug up that same text message. It's like, no longer than my pinky, but I think that's a singular honor that she just wanted some of my mac and cheese. Deepu, I think you know what I'm gonna be making this Thanksgiving. And Arunanti, I'm sure there's plenty of mashed potatoes and mac and cheese up upstairs. God bless. Thank you, 
everyone who came out. With that, we're just opening up the floor. If you're welcome to come, um, say a few words if you'd like, or please enjoy drinks and food and all the homemade desserts. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to say anything? No. <laughs> Ramesh, you need to go again and answer your detractors for all the calumny heaped upon you. My name came up for you. Yes. That in itself is a memorial. <laughs> How close you are. <laughs> Speak was good, man. Loud it. Loud it.